Good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Many blessings to you all. Good to see you all again. I am in today I'm going to um, replace Pastor Joe. He was scheduled to preach today, but he's a little bit under the weather, coughing up a storm. So let's keep him and his family in prayer. Also, Pastor Daryl, I think, is on a well-deserved vacation, which makes me the third string quarterback, doesn't that? <laughs> And it's on a Sunday as well. Nonetheless, I have a beautiful message for you upon short notice. And I shared it with one of our sister churches not too long ago uh, in San Francisco. And it's a very important message. It was on my heart, actually, to share this message with this church for quite some time. I think we had an exchange on Zoom about this topic, and I said, I hope to share it one time. So I have the notes ready, and I even have some nice slides for us, too. It's the most important subject, give or take, of all the essentials of the Bible. Bible. Understanding this one subject will help us understand our Bible more fluently. There's a lot of things that we skip over when we read the Bible because of lack of comprehension, and we say maybe we'll understand it later. If we download the comprehension, or as we'll talk about the apprehension of this one subject, we will have a more smooth driving course through our Bible. So the subject today will be understanding the Trinity. The title of this message will be Understanding the Trinity, a picture perfect presentation. I'm uh, going to have a disclaimer that not there is really no perfect picture to explain the Trinity away. The Trinity is God's nature. There is no one like the Lord's. And as such, we cannot look to a one uh, thing in creation or anything in the universe that really can fully compare. But I like what Dr. Norman Geiser, the late Dr. Norman Geiser said in a level of example, uh, the Trinity subject is like a, a rope that spreads all across the universe. I cannot comprehend it, but I can apprehend it. There's seven mysteries in the New Testament. You have great uh, is the mystery of godliness, that God became a man. Paul says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We have the mystery of Antichrist. And we have uh, the mystery of godliness that we'll be talking about today, where is God became a man. We're, gonna, we're going to be able to answer some questions. Uh, if God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ, and there is only only one God, who was Jesus talking to when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing? How can God be one and yet three, or three in one? We're going to be asking questions as, uh, where in the Bible does the term Trinity ever mentioned? Uh, this is going to be a, a very, another disclaimer is that it's going to be a very th um, basic general message. And to get more comprehension, you'll have to, uh, you will have to have more time. Uh, forgive me for uh, speech. I'm not the greatest of speakers, but just as the pastor and the preacher has to prepare a Bible message, we also have to prepare in coming to church and ready to receive from his word. So the Trinity, a good way to understand the Trinity is to understand, number one, what the Trinity is not. Some common misconceptions of the Trinity. Misconception number one is modalism. You can turn to the slides. So this is the Trinity. And by the way, I'm not raising my hand to vote. Those of you who are on Zoom, uh, we, we do, I don't have a clicker. So we're gonna make this as a cue for the next slide. And here will be the next slide. Common misunderstanding number one is modalism. Modalism teaches that there is one monotheistic God. 
and that he is playing three different roles in relation to others. To, so to some, he is uh, relation-wise acting as a father, acting as a son, and acting as the Holy Spirit. This is a heresy condemned by the early, early church. And unfortunately, it's still around today. Those of you who know Pastor T.D. T. D. Jakes, I think he went away from it, but he believed in modalism. Uh, Deion Sanders, my favorite athlete, give or take, uh, he also believed in modalism. But that is different than the Trinity. The biblical concept is different than modalism, and we'll see exactly why theology is important. And this will be like a class uh, of uh, theology. The, and we have a privilege with theology and to study the Bible because as believers, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have a special tool called the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ, so that when we are uh, alone in bed thinking of biblical matters, we have a special tool that the world does not have, the mind of Christ. This is important. So the Dr. Norman Geiser said this concerning the Trinity, this is the key doctrine of all doctrines, because the understanding of this one doctrine can affect all other doctrines, end quote. And so the disclaimer, this study, this study again, is that this will not be thorough, but basic in nature. <laughs> There are many mysteries in the Bible, many things that we do not understand in the Bible, like Jesus walked on water. I don't know how he did that. Jesus fed 5,000 from five bread and two fish. Did a fish come out of the mouth of another fish? Did the bread become bigger in the middle so that it would multiply to feed 5,000 people? I have no idea, but what? I believe by faith. So also with the doctrine of the Trinity, we may not fully understand it, but as Dr. Norman Geisler said, we can apprehend it and we trust it by faith because that is what the Bible teaches. It is unnatural for the natural to understand the supernatural. I hope that made sense. I hope we had some smart water before we came to church today. Dr. Norman Geisler, again, I'll be quoting some scholars throughout this. Uh, modalism is a heresy which teaches that there is just one person playing three different roles. And God is essentially one, but relationally three. Dr. John MacArthur says, in, exhibit, in exhibiting the unity between the members of the Trinity, the Word of God in no way denies a simultaneous existence and distinctiveness of each of the three persons of the Godhead. In other words, the Bible makes it clear that God is one God, but that one God is a tri-unity of persons, end quotes. The famous Council of Nicaea uh, denied modalism in AD 325, and 56 years later, the Council of Constantinople also denied modalism. Again, we're, go we're going to talk about what the uh, Trinity is not in order to help us to understand what the Trinity is, okay? The Council of Antioch at 267 AD denied a, gen a person by the name of Sebius of his modalistic view of the Trinity in comparison, uh, comparing it with the sun. The sun has three, that makes it one, right? It has lights. The, the sun gives heat. And then you have the actual physical sun. And so Sebius said this was a picture of the Trinity. But the Council of Antioch denied that because 
The sun rays is a lesser form of heat, a lesser form of light than the actual sun, right? When we get closer to the sun, it's hotter, it's brighter. Not so with the Trinity, because as we will see throughout this message, the Trinity is inseparable and it is equal in nature with no separations and no uh, distinctions in value and so on and so forth. So this, the sun is not the greatest of examples. Those of you who want to uh, follow along, Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 21. But before that, I'm going to quote another from Dr. John MacArthur. I quote, modalism denies the Trinity in teaching that God is sometimes a father, sometimes a son, and sometimes the Holy Spirit. But you will have trouble with that at Christ's baptism. At Christ's baptism, you remember when all the people, this is Luke chapter uh, 23 again. Sorry, Luke chapter 3. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he, Jesus, prayed, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Do you see that? So we have the one, the voice from heaven. Two, we have the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. And three, we have Jesus in the water. Very tough to accept modalism in the light of reading this passage and many others throughout the Bible. Again, when we download the basic comprehension, apprehension of the Trinity, we will be free from heresy. We will be vaccinated from heresy, if I can use that term. We will be more able to understand the Bible more fluently and clearly without skipping uh, uh, areas of confusion and concern. So consider this great point. Next point will be that God is love. And as such, that means love must be eternal, right? Because God is love. The question now is, if modalism was true, who did God love since there was nobody around in eternity, right? If, the, uh, if, if there was no one to communicate with, how did God learn how to communicate with others once he created them? And so you see, having a modalism view weakens our view of God because God is eternally love. But if you don't believe the Trinity, God has to what? Has to learn how to love when there's others around to love. Not so with the doctrine of the Trinity, because the Father eternally loves the Son. The Son eternally loves the Holy Spirit, and so on and so forth. And so you see, we have three distincts, but one unit. And this is what we find in John chapter 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So love existed Love for self existed, love for another existed, and love for a unity existed. Does that make sense? And so we learn how to love from God, not God learning how to love from us. Very important philosophical view on the Trinity. First John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love because he first loved us. I hope that made sense. Another misconception of the Trinity is that there is two thrones in heaven. And this is called binatarism. binatarism. You can turn to the next slide. And this is a misconception from Psalms 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand. It's going to get funner once we get to the picture slides, but this is important before we get to that. And understanding what the Trinity is not before we understand what the Trinity is. Excuse me. 
Another misconception is that Christ is 50% man and 50% God. Nothing could be further from the truth, as Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. Here's another popular one, tritheism. Tritheism, that there is three thrones. And Benny Hinn used to teach publicly, I don't know if he still does, I doubt that he still does, that tritheism was true. In fact, he said that each of the three members of the Trinity is a Trinity within themselves. So he, as he, as he mentions, I quote, there was nine of them. This is heresy. This doesn't fit with the biblical view at all. At all. So that's what tritheism is. Another misconception is that we can understand the Trinity by studying in seminary and through education, but nothing could be further from the truth because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And so it is a miraculous comprehension that the world without the mind of Christ is unable to comprehend. That's a very important point there. Flesh and blood, who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven has revealed it to you. We're, the message is going to get a little bit funner now because we're going to be using a different language that words cannot replace sometimes. And trying to understand what the Trinity is, sometimes we have to use a different language. And the title of this message is A Picture Perfect Presentation. But before we do that, we need to go to the divine DMV to pull a license to be able to use creation as examples, to be able to use pictures as examples of what the Trinity is. So if we turn to Romans chapter 1 verse 20, I'll read it for you. Uh, we're pulling a license from the great apostle Paul. Look, Paul, can we do such a thing in comparing God with creation and examples of pictures and so on? Will you be the judge? Verse 20 of Romans chapter 1. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So that men are without excuse. Okay, so we thank you, Paul. We're able to look at creation in the same way we are able able to look at an art piece from an artist and learn about the artist from his artwork. So also when we look at creation, we see some examples of how God's nature is as a triune being. But remember, there is no such perfect explanation of God. But when we look at these things, uh, samples, we'll get a better feel to apprehend the truth of the Trinity. Time. Time has a past. Time has a present. And time has a future. Now, inseparable is any one of those tenses in time. Can I have a present without having a past? No. Question, is the future different than the present? Yes. And you can also argue no, because they are both measurements of time. They are both tenses of time. How does this, how does this uh, uh, picture not fit too well. The, it would be better if it was a GIF. You guys know how you have those motion pictures and GIFs, uh, GIFs, I think you call them. Uh, if you had everything still, except for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit exchanging, because you don't want to say past is the Father and and the present is the Son and so on. The, I, the past could be the Son in this graph. 
and the spirit could be the future and, and so on and so forth. So the bottom part can always be moving, but the top part is pretty, pretty helpful for us finite beings trying to understand the eternal God. And Dr. James White, quoting another scholar, there is only one true, eternal, unchanging God, creator of all, all things, yet three co-equal and co-eternal distinct beings, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Dr. R.C. Sproul as well says, it is significant that in God's own being, we find both unity and diversity. Time is unity and diversity. Isn't that right? So we have that helpful analogy. We also have some bad analogies. And the egg. The egg is a bad analogy. How? Because some will argue that this, the egg shell is one, the white is two, and the yellow of the egg is three, as equal as one egg. That sounds good. But the problem with this is that you can, I have my cousin. Uh, Gus, his wife prepares for him eggs sometimes, and she does it without the egg, the, the yolk, the yellow part of the egg. So she separates not only the shell, but the yellow of the egg so that he can eat only the egg whites. You cannot do that with the Lord. The Trinity is inseparable yet codependent and equal in nature. We cannot separate the Father from the Son and the Spirit from the Father. The, it, it is impossible. And again, learning what the Trinity is not help us to learn what the Trinity is. This would be a good view for what? For tritheism. For tritheism, separate is the shell, separate is the whites, and separate is the yellows. Here's another analogy, it's a good one. One times one times one equals one. Father times the Son times the Holy Spirit equals God. I hope that made sense to you mathematicians out here. But what's the problem with this? Not only that one times one times one equals one, but also one times one times one times one times one times one times one also equals one. Not so with the Trinity. It's called tri-unity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the next analogy will help us out a little bit more. Again, there is no perfect analogy that we can compare our Lord with. He is transcendent, perfect, with no comparison. Blessed be his name. But this will help us a little bit better. Who knows that the three primary colors of the rainbow equal black when evenly mixed. Are you with me? Does these slides help? Because now we have one red times one yellow times one blue equals a solid one black. Can I add another one? No. What happens if I have another one red? I will have an uh, equals a dark black red. But evenly mixed, one times one times one equals a solid one. Again, we're using different language in understanding the Trinity. Sometimes words cannot help. I'm going to read from uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. Verse 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So he's not a human, but he was made in human likeness. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and be, by becoming obedient, obedient to death, 
even death on the cross. Verse 9, Therefore God has exalted him unto the highest place and given him a name that is above all names that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Verse 10 and 11. So what we have with the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, he took on something additional. He took on the additional nature of a man. He's not a man, but being found to be in the appearance of a man. He's not uh, obedient, but he became obedient. He is God. God became obedient. He was also made a little bit lower than the angels. Is that not right? Hebrews chapter 2, I believe. See that? So God became a man. He took on an additional nature. Very important. Because of all the examples of the Trinity, my personal favorite is the triangle. The triangle, you have equal corners, equal angles, equal space in the middle, and you have a distinction. What if I change the angles just a little bit? I'll have a trapezoid. Those of you who know geometry. Okay, so I cannot alter the triangle at all and still have a triangle. So also, I cannot alter the Trinity at all and still have a Trinity. What is wrong with this picture? Well, where is the order? What if I flip it on upside down? Uh, you see, there's really no perfect explanation of the Trinity, but God help us by his grace to reveal to us what he revealed to Peter. Flesh and blood cannot help understand what the Trinity is, but God, by God's grace, these pictures help us only apprehend the God, God's nature. We are not dissecting a frog. We are dissecting God. And as such, we have to go by faith. So if Jesus became a man and took on the additional nature, what happened then? We took on an additional shape. The triangle is three-sided. Not so with the circle. The circle is a separate shape, a different nature than the triangle. But do notice, please, lest we also have a heresy, that the circle did not leave the triangle, right? You see that it is still touching and connected to the triangle. Remember, Jesus is not 50% God and 50% man. Philippians chapter 2 says that he became a man and humbled himself does not mean that he forfeited being God. That's impossible. That's impossible, like a squared circle or a single bachelor. You can't have it. If you have, if you do have, and some heresies do have this teaching that Jesus temporarily left the divine nature and became a man. This is a misunderstanding of Holy Bible. And when you read the Bible, you will be confused if you hold on to this view. May God open our eyes and open our ears so that we may see the miraculous conception of the Holy Trinity, the most important of doctrines, according to Dr. Norman Geisler. Because if you, understand, if you don't understand this one doctrine, you will be confused in just about all other essentials in our Bible. And that would be a problem. And that would give birth to more heresies and so on and so forth. Almost done. Not only is the Holy Trinity inseparable, equal in nature, and have distinction within the unity, but the Holy Trinity also has distinction in what? Distinction in roles. Distinction in ministry. Distinctions in roles and ministry. The Father sends the Son yet remains supreme, not the humbled one. The Son sends the Holy Spirit and takes on the additional nature of the man. He empties himself and becomes Lord and the angel. The Holy Spirit becomes the servant of Christ. 
The Holy Spirit brings the divine to our human experience. See, and so you see, there is different distinctions within the Godhead, the Trinity. If I want to cool my drink, H2O is water. Which form of H2O will I use if I want to cool my drink? I won't say soda because I don't drink soda. I haven't drank a soda maybe, I would say, probably since 2015. I haven't touched soda. If I want to cool my soda, which form of water do I use? Do I use the gas form? Or do I use a solid ice form? Does that make sense? Water is water. The nature is all the same, but it comes in a liquid, a solid, and a gas. So also the Father sends the Son. The Son sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings God's divine experience in our emotions. Does that make sense? There is distinctions within the roles of the Trinity, just as you have water equal in nature with distinctions of purpose. If I want to steam rice or fish, do I use ice? No, I use the gas form. I hope that's making sense. I hope that makes sense. Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. One, the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you too. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Three, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord with three distinctive roles. Just as water has three distinction roles. Now what's wrong with the analogy of water? Pretty much the same as with the sun. You can separate the water. You can put the ice over there and you can have your water drink liquid over here. Inseparable is the Trinity and the Godhead. Inseparable is the Trinity and the Godhead. And I hope this is all making sense. Now we'll take a look at Genesis chapter 1. If you turn to Genesis chapter 1, we're almost done, starting in verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in verse 27. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Let us make man. And our image is singular. And our image is plural. So God, singular, created mankind in his own image, singular, right? And so you see the plural becomes singular. God willing, sometime later, we'll have a part two to this message, which will be titled uh, Understanding the Trinity, a literary masterpiece, how we can see how verses and so on will teach us about the Trinity. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, the next slide. The Hebrew Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. They, uh, Judaism and uh, the Jews of the Old Testament always use this in order uh, for them to start their, their prayers and their, their, their teachings and so on when they get together. The Hebrew Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. All right? Now, in our Bible, the Lord is one, O-N-E. But in the Hebrew Bible and the Hebrew language, there's two words for one. Okay? Don't, don't let the two and the one come mix things up. In the Hebrew language, I have two options in translating the one in English. There is Yahid and there is Ichad. What's the difference? This is one cluster of grapes, right? That would be one ichad of grapes, one unit of grapes, one cluster of grapes. Okay, there's also yachid. 
which is one single individual grape. Those of you who love the warriors, this is one ichad or yachid. This is one ichad, one group, one team called the warriors. And if you want to go back to 2017, there's one individual yachid of the warriors. Kevin Durant, 2017, I think to 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So you see, that's a Yahid individual, and Ichad is a group. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Which one was used? If it was modalism, it would be Yahid. If it was Trinity, it would be Ichad. Which one was used? Ichad. Actually, go back, sorry. Go back two more. Yes, okay, one more. There you go. So God is one cluster, not one individual grape, as modalism teaches. In the Hebrew Shema, the Trinity was there. Hero Israel, the Lord your God is Ichad, not Yahid. Hope that made sense. Hope that made sense. R.C. Sproul says the reason the church came up with the term Trinity is to as accurately as possible define the biblical concept and defend it from heretical views such as modalism, end quote. Where in the Bible is Trinity, the term Trinity located? Nowhere in the Bible. Well, I am holding a Bible, and the word Bible is not in the Bible. Am I, does that make sense? And so we use theological terms to help us sometimes. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. Understanding the Trinity, a picture, perfect presentation. I hope it made sense is my prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord. Blessed be your name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we thank you. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study your word. We thank you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as revealed in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for not being a God far off in the distance, but you have revealed yourself to us. How does a spider talk to a spider? You become a spider. How does a bird talk to another bird? You become a bird. I thank you, Lord, for becoming a man in order for us to relate with you. We thank you, Lord, for the awesome tool by your grace that we have the mind of Christ so that we are able to comprehend what the world is unable to comprehend. We pray, Lord, that you may open our eyes and open our ears so that we may see and hear the secrets of your word when we read the Holy Scriptures. We pray, Lord, that you may reveal yourself by your grace to all those who seek you with all their hearts. We thank you, Lord, for protecting us from heresy by the study of your word. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for God becoming a man in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, the salvation plan. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might have the righteousness of God in him. We thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in your wonderful name of Jesus, we pray, and God's people said, Amen. Amen.